Hey guys, welcome to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. I'm Tracy Friedlander, and today on the show, I have Drew Alexander Ford, who is that viola kid on Instagram. Drew is a violist who has over 120,000 followers, which puts him in a super small group. Only a handful of classical musician Instagrammers have reached over 100,000 followers. I had him on today to dive into how he does it, why he does it, And what is the secret sauce to getting people to engage with a classical musician on the largest social media platform on earth? I wanted to know. Drew is currently performing on a cruise tour with Holland America through a partnership with Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. Luckily, he was able to find time on his four-month tour to do this episode, even though he has to be in a public space to use their Wi-Fi. So please bear with me that the audio is a little less than perfect. His message about social media is so invigorating at a time when a ton of musicians are trying to figure out their place on social media. So I wanted to bring him on now and hear what it's all about. But before we get started, I'd like to thank Fix Music for being a sponsor of Crushing Classical Podcast. Fixmusic.com is your online resource for high quality sheet music at great prices. Check out their latest offerings like hard to get music and frequently backordered parts. Fix also offers unique solutions for teachers and schools buying music. Whether you have a large private teaching studio or you run a music program, Fix has a solution for you. Contact them through their website for more information. And Fix now offers free shipping on all domestic orders. So remember to use the special discount link in the show notes and get 10% off your order. And Drone Tuner, an incredibly revolutionary tuner app, is now available in the Apple App Store. You may be thinking, another tuner app? Why do I need this one? Let me tell you why. Do you tune with a drone or constant tone coming out of your tuner? Are you tired of that nasty mechanical sound? This app has samples of recorded live musicians for your drone work. It is such a pleasure to tune to a sound that is your exact instrument. Not only that, the visuals on this app are super fast and the reaction time is like no other tuner app on the market. You can tune intervals and chords within a key so you know if your major thirds are too sharp or just right. You can tune using vibrato if you play with vibrato and you can even tune a chord with a friend. Some reviews on Drone Tuner, best app ever. I have never felt more comfortable playing in ensembles after using this app for just a few weeks. And I used the Drone Tuner to tune my college orchestra this morning. Worked great with the iPad 4. Check out our website, dronetunerapp.com, to see video tutorials on how the app works or check out the videos in the App Store. Drone Tuner is currently available on iOS for iPhone and iPad. Get yours today at the iTunes App Store. The link is in the show notes. Let's get started. Hey, Drew Alexander Ford. Hi. Hi, that viola (laughs) kid. So you are on some kind of crazy cruise tour right now yeah i'm uh i'm touring with holland america lines on the westerdam i'm a so cruise cool. ship musician so i'm playing lincoln center stage we play three different shows every night uh today's my off night thank goodness yeah that's so busy to, yeah oh it's so busy i i'm not i'm used to like playing three concerts a week not yeah. three concerts a night so it's like what is that like by the third one are you are you just how do you oh, get your energy back up for that yeah coffee I'm, I'm literally, I'm becoming a user of coffee, which <laughs> I didn't want to happen, but like, I'm finding that that's a trend for entrepreneurs. You know, you yeah. have to push, you have to dig deep yeah. and uh, you have to sleep less and work more. So that's, that's kind of how I'm going. Right yeah. Now. So let's talk about that. You are an entrepreneur. You're, you are really breaking molds on kind of what is expected really of musicians i think it's i think i think we're at the ground floor here though and you're you're definitely paving the way for something new so you for for those of you if you don't if you're not on instagram that's the only way that you don't know who we're talking to right now because drew is do people call you drew drew alexander yeah, uh, Drew. Drew is fine. Okay, yeah. Drew. Um, <laughs> I should have asked you that before I press record. That's all. all good. <laughs> um, so you you are like the king of Instagram, and um, well, like so I've been I've been following you for a while, and I'm mm-hmm. I'm kind of a noob on Instagram because I got on there thinking, okay, just gonna get on here like I am on Facebook and do to do. Post and it's, pictures. Yeah. Post some pictures. Post whatever. 
say whatever and and it'll grow and it's grown grad really slowly gradually but it there's a whole other thing to instagram and so recently i was like damn it i've had enough i'm going to study yeah. this i'm going to figure this out and as i've been following you I've noticed like, wow, he's really stepped up his game. Like there's some other stuff going on here. There's some, yeah. there's like, the story is like a vlog. It's, it's, there's some crazy, <laughs> you know? So, um, so when did you get started on Instagram? I got started back. It was, I remember the first day I downloaded Instagram, I bought a brand new, like, it was like my first touchscreen smartphone. Um, this back was on, I was on like, metro pcs so i got one of those cheap like huawei Ooh. touch screens and i saw i could download instagram this is not so iphone wrote, days no iphone here. No, no 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 this was pre-iphone <laughs> this is pre-samsung for me at least and so i was like i, I was in college i was a uh, college junior okay what year is that I, what year is that this is 2013 okay this is fall 2013. okay this is before i knew what instagram was okay great oh i mean i've been <laughs> hearing about it since like 2011 i've been hearing about like okay like hey uh you are you on instagram and i'm like nah like that's that's that, that stuff's for the birds you know what i mean yeah i don't yeah. take pictures i don't put on filters <laughs> but uh i been around it for a little bit i'd seen how cool it was to put filters and then change the way your pictures look and make your pictures look better yeah and so i was like that's kind of cool and it may be a way to meet some chicks so i was like okay let me download <laughs> this. so <laughs> so on my birthday i'm at my uh, mom's graduation for her master's she's getting a master's in psychology mm -hmm. but there were like a thousand people getting their degrees too so i was sitting there with my best friend he drove me up to atlanta from macon georgia to go to my mom's graduation which happened to be on my birthday my birthday september 29th 2013 so if you scroll back to the very bottom of my oh wow feed, you'll see my very first post on instagram okay it's so selfie. it's still there it is still it's there it's still there I've, I've not deleted most of my stuff from when i first started this so, is so great that so you can get look back that's so you awesome can look back and see how i've changed and so how i've conceived of posting how i thought about storytelling so you started um, you yeah. started as like this is my personal account i like you didn't come on yeah. here going i'm gonna get insta famous now no no, no. okay no okay. no but what was addictive was like having cute girls liking my pictures that was dope <laughs> so i was like how do i get more than eight likes you know what I mean? right so, right so that um, was what the motivation was at first the, it was i mean i'm a i'm, I'm a simple man but also <laughs> i so what was really interesting was the college i went to the robert mcduffie center for strings was mm -hmm. in it was a special undergraduate conservatory program at a liberal arts college and the program was predicated upon conservatory level training and entrepreneurial mindsets. So we took public speaking, we took business classes. So that was your things. undergrad experience? Yes. Oh. And that was always something that I kind of wanted to do. I didn't want to work for somebody my entire life. And I was also in tandem, I had a side business uh, with a uh, network marketing company. Um, and so it was so funny. I went to a convention in Columbus, Ohio uh, at the very end, like November, 2013. Um, and I went to the convention and the keynote speaker was none other than Gary Vaynerchuk. No way. Yes way. That's how I got introduced to Gary Vaynerchuk because I was a network marketer. In 2013. In 2013. This okay, so this pre, is. Yeah, this is like jab, 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 right hook. Okay. Gary Vaynerchuk, like post crush it, post thank you economy. Um, so I was like, yeah, I was, he was pumped. He was pumping me up. He got me so jacked. He was like, yo, uh, you're a media company, whether you like it or not, you need to figure out how to use these platforms to build your business or else you're gonna work for somebody else. Dang. And I was like, that's so right. Like, that's so right. So it was from that keynote that inspired me to buy Jab, 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 Right Hook. Okay. And then from then on uh, around, I would say December, January, that, that cusp 2013, 2014, that change in year was when I decided to take Instagram much more seriously. Okay. And, and so uh, at that point, did you flip it to a business account or did you, you know, like you just kept it? That was it... before that was available. Oh, that was, oh, okay. That was before that was available. That was back when 15 second videos were still a thing. You know, that's when, um, oh. trying to remember, that's when the borders were blue. That's when it had the old icon. You know? Okay. Yeah. And 15 seconds, now it's a minute long, right? That you can do. It's a do. minute long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
right. That was before stories. Before stories. Well, stories just yeah. came out really kind of recently. So, 2015, believe it or not. Oh, really? two, like, yeah, I know it's it's crazy. Right? Wait a second. So maybe like 2016, the, maybe 2000. The fact that I'm like, but, ooh, gotta do, you know, like that must have. It seems like a second, and really, it was like took me two years to do it. You know, like at, for at a least, year. At least a year and a half. Yeah. Because that, that's there, and people say, oh, I don't know what that is. Nobody's really using it, so they, it just sits there for a while. That's crazy. Exactly. Or people are like, oh, my gosh, my following's bigger than Snapchat. Let me go ahead and use Instagram stories instead. Uh -huh. Okay, so here's, here's the thing that I thought was so gangster by, uh, by Zuckerberg, because uh, Facebook owns Instagram. They bought yes. Instagram for a billion dollars. A billion. I remember that. A billion. And that was a steal. Gary Vaynerchuk went, was on, on the record. He was like, it was a steal. Yeah. And it was. He was completely right. So Facebook also tries to buy a Snapchat for like, I think three or four billion. I forget the, the figure. It was, it was like. And they said no. It was retirement money. It was retirement money for the rest of your lineage. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. but no, they were like, they were like, nah, nah, I'm not going to do it. So Facebook's like, okay. So we're going to take our assets and we're going to kill your market by adding stories to one of our subsidiaries. It was so dirty. And, and, and Instagram definitely took a bite out of that market. And, it, and Snapchat has been uh, trying to recover since. Are you still it's, on it's Snapchat? Been... Yeah, I, I have a new Snapchat strategy that I want to implement. Mm -hmm. But based off of reading Crushing It. So I have all these new ideas on how I'm going to use each platform to highlight an aspect of my day or myself and my business. Okay. Uh, but I can't do that on a cruise ship when the Wi-Fi is like 500 kilobytes per second or something. Like that. Yikes. It's really slow. It's, it's yeah. just, it's impossible to even stream anything. So. Right. So tell me, I have so many questions about yeah, how you go. built up Instagram, but yeah. you mentioned your business. So what, what is your business? Right now, it's still a developing idea what it is mostly is content creation and pretty much what i'm trying to do is build a lifestyle music presence okay the future business that i want to build is a kind of like a boutique uh agency where we create content for classical musicians principally musicians in general but classical musicians especially okay we take the photo shoots we shoot the videos we do the editing and then we consult them on how to disseminate this content and give them consulting services uh in perpetuity okay and so these yeah. are are these the kind of classical musicians who are entrepreneurial and building something on their own this isn't no. going to be like oh no so this is for those who don't know what they're doing because if okay. schools aren't going to, so th this is going to be a multi-service, uh, uh, multi-service business. Like, if schools aren't going to provide the education, my business will provide the education. We right. go and do seminars, we do master classes, we do residencies. Oh, in uh, school, you want to go in into schools. the schools? Okay. I'll go. I'll go into colleges and have seminars. Okay. Because kids need to be armed with this knowledge. Like, it's just right. not sustainable to ignore social media anymore and you have to do it correctly well tell and me this this might be this yeah. might be a little bit um controversial so hopefully you'll answer the question sure. but what do you think about um entrepreneurship um classes right now are they missing the boat on some level or do you think it's a good thing i think it's a step in the right direction but it's one thing to it's one thing to be somebody who uses uh who uses like nail polish it's another thing to have nail polish otaku this is just an example it's one thing to be kind of like oh entrepreneurship is nice to have but it's another thing to build your entire career with the with entrepreneurship baked in right and one class in a semester is not enough to impart right that. you could google more information in an afternoon than what those classes provide. Right, and I think two things, much. two things. One is it's all about studying about doing a thing and not actually doing the thing, and that's the problem. And the second thing is I think there are still a lot of musicians, you can tell me what you think about this because you probably know from your own audience feedback, but um, I've heard from talking with um, other, from, from talking with entrepreneur teacher like teachers and people who are in charge of those programs at certain schools that there's there's like a vibe 
with students, some students are interested in it and are like, okay, I see the value in it. And a, and a lot of the performer, performance majors think that it's a backup plan or it's what you do if you fail getting into an orchestra. So what do you think about that? Well, that's, that's a lot to unpack. Um, yeah. I can say a lot of my colleagues that I went to school with at Juilliard have a very, and they very well may succeed, they have a very soloist, chamber musician, or orchestral mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, social media is just something you do in your spare time. It's not right the now. avenue. Yeah. It, yeah, right now. So mm -hmm. it's, because, it's because the powers that be, the board members, the people that really are curating the education are living in the 20th century. Yeah. The 21st century is almost 20 years old. We're almost two decades in the 21st century. And the internet's been around, like we're a generation that grew up with the internet. It is, the thing is there's a disproportionate, uh, and this is Gary Vaynerchuk speaking, there's a disproportionate cognitive dissonance between what people actually do and what they practice. People mm -hmm. actually go home and jump on Facebook for three hours after school or after work. But in practice, what they say is go practice your scales. Don't actually document what you're doing anyway. Don't do that because if it's not perfect, you're not going to be hireable. And I just find that to be a flawed narrative. Nobody is flawless. And if you try to use social media to portray a flawless nature, it's disingenuous and it, it doesn't really add any value. No, it really doesn't. it's not believable. So, Exactly. It's not, and it's not a good story. It's not human. No, it's, it's not human. It's not a good story. Right. So you said uh, that you think people perceive it as that they won't be hireable. But so do mm -hmm. you think that in the future uh, that will be an element in deciding if people are hireable, hireable for, for I think gigs? it's already happening. It's already for happening. For gigs. Um, people, people will go and like even now, I mean, it, we're not so in the Stone Ages in the the canonical classical realm that people won't go to YouTube and search for your stuff. Right. And that's why people, they'll go and delete videos. I mean, I had a cons consultation with a very high, well-renowned uh, agent who used to be an agent for Hillary Hahn and like some of the greatest players. And she was like, she told me to my face, you're just not good enough to really like land uh, agency stuff right now from what you have online. And you mean your so musical, really, your music, your musical my, ability. My ability. Yeah, exactly. So Ouch. And the thing is, is like, <laughs> I mean, it's real. Like I get it. And uh -huh. I uh, kind of agree because I'm not a Tabea Zimmerman. I'm not a competition winner. I'm not, mm. you know, I'm not that guy. So that's you know what still, what I mean? that's, 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 that stuff, that area is still pretty old school then. Like they're still oh, looking for, uh -huh. yeah. but the th that business model is flawed because who cares if you win competitions? Like, if you can't put butts in seats, you're not useful to promoters. Right. You're and not useful to venues. I hate to say it. This might sound rude, but also who cares about a viola soloist? No offense. <laughs> Ow. No, but like, <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about like million, like everyone who's at the Gary Vaynerchuk talk or whatever. Like are... I'm talking about like there's so much larger of an audience than the people who go to a concert to hear a viola soloist or vi mm -hmm. I mean are there viola solo I know there's violin solos but there are few there there are few the thing being a soloist is already on its way out like let's be uh -huh. real, if you're not long long if you're not Eugene Wong if you're not right. Josh Bell that's that's Eugene what Wong. I mean by it like I'm talking about like these are the these are the concerts that less and less people are going to anyway. So like, exactly. say you do get that representation and you're hired and you go and play with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra mm -hmm. and all, you, you do this tour or whatever, but that stuff is starting to dwindle and what's replacing it is, um, I don't know, movie concerts because that's what, well, people, you know. Let me tell you something though. It's not because of the music, it's not because of the venues, it's not any of that, it's because the people who are on stage aren't relatable. And I'm here to really prove that you can have a solo career. You can have major symphony orchestras invite you without winning competitions. You can have them invite you uh, to come in solo because not only because you're like a decent player, I don't think I'm a terrible player, but I'm not like in the top at all, but I want to be one day. And so maybe one day I will be, and then it'll make more organic sense. But at the end of the day, I think if you're able to come through Detroit and be like, hmm, I want to do a concert in Detroit, and you get 
proof that people are going to show up to that concert. Right. How is the Detroit Symphony really going to turn you down? Because who runs that Detroit Symphony? Not the musicians who are like necessarily judging you, but the people who are the uh, people who make the money for the symphony. So if you, it, like you said, if you can prove that you're going to sell this place out, you know. And it helps to be good because like, of course, he wants to like sell out a show and then just be absolute garbage. Right. But like the, 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 the fact that people like Lindsey Sterling are able to make, are able to sell out stadiums is a yeah. true testament to the fact that social media is about connecting to an audience yeah. and getting them invested in you and then coming to, because the one thing, the most valuable thing I learned from my entrepreneurial class at Juilliard was people don't go to concerts for music. They don't, they never have, they never will. They go to concerts for people. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's diff It's like, okay, let's, an example, um, in the min, in, in New York film, you know, you've got New York film concert going on. It's not the New York film playing. Okay. But you see on the, uh, there's a traveling orchestra. They're playing Tchaikovsky four. You're like, ah, okay, <laughs> maybe. I'm, I mean, I'd rather see the New York Phil people. Yeah. I'd rather see the New York Phil do that. Or you could see, oh, it's like the Transylvania Philharmonic or whatever, but they got right. Yo-Yo Ma playing Rococo variations at the end. You're going to go to that concert because Yo-Yo Ma. Right. You know what I mean? It's always about the people. It always will be. And so if you focus on developing a relationship with people, <laughs> you're going to do a lot better. Uh, yeah. So tell me this. Audience. What do you think about what the social, the social media game of, of orchestras these days? Because what I see, uh, I'll just, well, you know what, I'll ask you and then I'll tell you my opinion mm -hmm. after that. Like what, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're trying. Some, most people are, most, most managements have their, um, their, their stake in the ground on Instagram and Facebook and whatever. But what are they doing that you would do differently if you could um, give them some advice? Huh, that's a great question. I think being more vulnerable and being more personal. Mm -hmm. And really talking about things that resonate with the 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 people that want to come. Like, I don't follow too many orchestras on social media. Um, I think New York Phil's the only one I follow. Maybe Minnesota Orchestra, but they never pop up in my feed, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Algorithms. <laughs> we'll get to that soon. <laughs> um, I what I would love to know is more about the people on stage. Yes. You know more personal stories, actual advice coming. Cause the thing is, is like orchestras need to be more than just jukeboxes. They need to be community engagers. They yes. need to like, if you've got young students that are learning, they're taking lessons from these kids. This is why I have such a, a strong love for the Atlanta symphony. They have music programs outside of the orchestra that are run by orchestra members. So I know these members so personally and intimately because they were my mentors. Mm -hmm. These orchestra, orchestral musicians need to be mentors. Yes. They need to like say, oh, if you're not doing vibrato, this one time I had my vibrato locked up, lock up and this one thing changed it. Having, they should all have blogs. They all should all have <clears throat> Q&A FAQs. Yes. Uh, like what if this was, so you think this, sh this should be a part, an integral part of getting a job in an orchestra now? It really, I mean, it should because that's how you start rebuilding a community uh -huh. uh, by attracting younger people, by giving them mentorship. Right. But let's be real. Like what we said before, I don't know if it was off the air, but uh, we said that a lot of people who try to get into orchestral jobs just want the blue collar mindset to do the bare yep. minimum. Just play my music. I mean, play my Don Juan, get off stage, go home, call it a day. Yep. It's not about the community to right. a lot of people and to a lot of board members. There's a lot of lip service. We need to diversify our audience. We need to do this, mm -hmm, we do that. Mm -hmm. They get more people of color on stage, but what are they doing to actually do it? Right. Very little. Right. Very little. And musicians don't expect to have that as part of their job. I And they complain and groan when you ask them to do yes oh i've posted about that and gotten really i've gotten unfollowed for that you know like people will come on and go if that was part of my job i would be you know i have a lot to do i have to get ready for a concert i have to practice you know that can't be part of my thing i've had that comment before it's like really then you really aren't that good if you need all day every day to practice like let's be real but no for real i i, I, I agree. Don't mean to shoot shade but it's like if you can't get it done in four hours 
you need it's just like it's probably not gonna happen that yeah day. but that's so, what I was gonna say about I mean I love your answer and what I was gonna say is what's interesting and of course it's obvious um, the people who are running the marketing for an orchestra are the people who are doing the social media and so but when you're looking at an orchestra who do you who are you going there for? Not the person who, you know, not Jane Smith in the orchestra office who's like posting up an Instagram post. You know, it's, it it's should, not. They should all have training. They should all have marketing training. They should all have. And it should be about the musicians set. and the music, yes. like Instagram story takeover by, you know, bass trombone player. You know, New York does do a little bit of that. And that's a step in the right direction. Yeah. I can tell it's because there's a lot of resistance from the orchestra, but I'm telling you, if you had, if you literally just bought a camera mm -hmm. and gave it and just passed it around the not orchestra, even the had, phone, so they could they could the edit it and an do it later. Actual camera, an yeah, actual camera. No, you literally just have them take a bunch of fun shots, uh -huh. and every and it's a privilege. Like every, it's like you make it a game. Everybody gets it. Somebody gets it every day. You know, somebody mm -hmm. different. So the perspective of the orchestra is different. They take pictures yeah. backstage. They take pictures this, this, and that, and just just give them requirements to make like take like twenty five to thirty photos. Okay, mm -hmm. you're gonna find one good one, right? One candid moment, one fun right. moment, and then give all those things to a designated marketing person who knows how to edit, who knows how to create the color palette. Which that's market. funny because I don't think <sighs> most marketing people know that kind of marketing. Like they're. <laughs> They're, they're calling up the radio station to get a radio uh, ad in place for whatever, you know. They, they're not versed. They're not, not yeah. versed in native Instagram. Uh, they're not versed in native content creation right. for each of the platforms, right. which is an essential skill right. in today's day and age. Right. And so, that's just something a Google search away. Right. So let's take it back to when you yeah. first started and when mm -hmm. you first realized, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this thing on Instagram. This is turning into a thing for me. You had did you like decide on a platform like i i'm gonna say this stuff i'm gonna this is why i'm here or like what where did you start um that's such a great question you know i'd always wanted to be a youtuber but i was always too afraid to do youtube because okay. of the the knowledge gap so instagram was much more palatable to me it was much easier to understand mm. i felt it was like a mini youtube it was like a yeah. mini way to like create a story, a narrative, and try to just document what's going on in my life. <laughs> Useful things that I think could give value. So from the start, you were like, okay, this is a storytelling thing. It's always storytelling. Yeah. Everything we do is storytelling. Mm -hmm. Music is storytelling. Totally agree. So we just yeah. can't dissociate. We can't, we can never forget that. And I think a lot of people, they get off track and they forget about the story. But was your story about I'm a violist who went to Juilliard at first, or like, did you have a specific well, message? My story was journey, journey to Juilliard. Like, I started oh. Instagram before I even went to Juilliard. Well, okay. And so I started this hashtag called Journey to Juilliard when I was like doing my graduate school auditions, and I was recording myself in the practice room, recording myself in rehearsals, recording myself, you know, preparing for my recital, different things like that. Recording myself on flights. I created a story arc narrative within that hashtag. Mm. Um, and that was my first kind of like explosion. Like I went to. I got to interject probably, before I yeah. forget. You, mm -hmm. you created a story arc narrative within a hashtag. Tell mm -hmm. me more about what that means. Sorry to break that apart, your no, story. It's but No, it's fine. Um, I, I coined a unique hashtag. Yeah, because people always want to do. Everyone wants to do that. I mean, you have two now or three, right? I've, 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 I like to think that I have three, one of them, I kind of just like assimilated from a follower. They're like, you should just take over the nation. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there's journey to Juilliard. I don't really work with that anymore. That was a, that was a very, uh, fine, a definite, like very finite, uh, little campaign. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what it is, is like hashtags are only a way to organize a group of photos. That's right. all it is. It's a hyperlink to a category of photos. Mm -hmm. It's a tagging system, a hashtag. So what I did was I just, everything that I, that was going towards Juilliard, everything that was a step forward towards my goal of getting into Juilliard yeah. was used, was with the, the hashtag journey to Juilliard was, was employed. Okay. And so that's kind of how 
that kind of address. Nice. So, okay, so, so, you're, so you're using this hashtag. You decided right from the start, got to use a hashtag. This is my journey to Juilliard. So, mm -hmm. so you documented the whole thing. What mm -hmm. happened on audition day? Did you, did you document that too? Yes, uh, right. The, what was the, I think, yeah, I took a picture with a bunch of my friends who were jumping in the air in Times Square. And I was like, I fi we finished auditions. I did it. Now I got to wait. <laughs> and so then I went on spring break. And then I just started just taking more pictures, more videos, and uh, interacting with, with fans, doing a lot of hashtag diving. By this point, content. how many followers did you have? I was still under 1,000. I remember I was on the beach in Miami uh, when I hit 1,000 followers. And I had just got my first rejection letter. So I was like, oh. So it was like both happy and sad. But, uh, but yeah, no, it, it, and then, it, and then for a long time, I would say, yeah, for a very long time, it was like a thousand followers a month. Okay. Like a thousand followers. A and month. you're posting, and how, how much were you posting a day to, to like have that once, growth? Once, a, once a day. This was back when there was no <laughs> algorithm. It was just timeline based. This mm -hmm. is back when you didn't get blocked for liking too many photos and a hashtag for too many comments. Gosh. Um, so I was we should go into that me. later because that's yeah, that's insane. It's still possible. It's still possible. It's just you have to spread it out more. I would just spend hours just double tapping. My like my thumbs would go numb, just like. Okay, so you're interacting. <laughs> like I think that's what a lot of people miss out on too. Is they think okay, my Instagram is not growing, but that's because they post and then they wait for likes and then they yeah. post. It. You know what I mean? The thing is, is like too many people feel entitled to a following and. My question to them is like, what are you providing? Like, right. what sort of value What's in it for them? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to create a profile that makes people want to follow you. You have right. to create something that is valuable. And if you are not the master, if you're not even very good, it's about the documentation. Maybe the underdog story. Maybe watching you grow every single day just a little bit is valuable to people. Yeah. So what do you think about when people just put up a video of them practicing, but that's all they, they don't tell the rest of the story. Do you think there's more, there's more they could be doing as far as that? Cause I know, I mean, I'm spending a lot of time on Instagram and I see lots of people putting up videos and, and it's, it's fine, you know, put up videos of yourself practicing. That's a documentation in and of itself, but it doesn't, it, there's, I feel like there's a little bit of a missing link there. It's not enough because number one, everybody's trying to do it now. Like yeah. back when I, back when it was me, Chloe Trevor, M. Bassett 82, there was John Hannafin, there was uh, Niles Luther, uh, and that's, a, and there's Michael Cello. They were okay. like, they were like a, like a dozen, maybe a half dozen um, wow. Instagrammers that were like doing this back in like 2013. And, uh, it was very, and we all had like different shticks. We all had different aesthetics. So we all started kind of growing in tandem. Mm -hmm. uh, Chloe being at the forefront, because she's been on it just way longer than everybody. She's like the OG Chloe Trevor Violin is like the OG uh, classical musician uh, on Instagram. She's like the figurehead. Yeah. Um, but aside from that, no. What, so it was much easier to build a following back then because they were just, uh -huh. it wasn't everybody in their hamster trying to build it. Yeah, you were what like Gary Vee on YouTube in 1995 or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Yeah, before he went to Vidler and messed up. But, uh, <laughs> I don't even know we're that not, story. We're not, oh, yeah, no, he went to Vidler because they offered him steak in the company. Stopped posting YouTube and started posting exclusively to Vidler and missed out on the explosive growth of uh, YouTube in 2007, 2008. Oh. So, so we missed out on that way, Oops. but it's whatever. Yeah, it's whatever. Uh, and he talks about it. He's, un, he's unapologetic about it. But anyway, um, the thing that people are missing when they are trying to build their following, when they're posting, they're documenting, is just that. They're not interacting. They're not being a part of the community. They're not giving their two cents. They're not commenting on other people yes. who are practicing. They're not asking questions. They're not giving feedback. Right. They're literally just saying, hey, I'm here. Love me. Okay, mm -hmm. bye. You know, it's just, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's so yeah. much more you got to do. And yeah. It's a job. 
it's a job. You have to spend hours and hours on hours and hours. If you want extraordinary results, you have to give extraordinary effort. Okay, so how much time do you spend on Instagram a day? I don't anymore. I don't anymore. And mostly because of the mostly because I'm so so in the creation mode, I'm no longer able to justify spending time. I see. Um so the time that I would use to spend to engage in liking, I'm using editing videos or photos okay. or planning content or writing blogs or shooting. You know what I mean? So that's why I want to get a team <laughs> so I yeah. can go back to the grassroots, see what, uh, see what worked. Right. But, um, Which you'll be able to do when you're, when you're monetizing. Yes. Which yes, is, yes, 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 yes. so it sounds like this is a really so, long game. So you have oh, not, you have not monetized your following as of yet. Is that correct? Not, not consistently. No, I, I created a mug and a t-shirt. Okay. A couple so it's some bucks, merchandise. It's just some, some small merch. And it's funny. Nobody really wanted it then, but now people really want merch. So it's like, I had, I had merch. You just, <laughs> you have to time the market. And I just missed that. I missed that, that timing. The, uh, so what it is, what I did is, was I, I told myself, I gave myself the permission to fail and work my butt off for 10 years. And mm. if it didn't work out in 10 years, then I would reconsider. But, uh, I'm only four and a half years, almost five years into it. So like, I still have time and that's why I'm kind of retreating a little bit. Now that I'm on this cruise ship, I'm away from Wi-Fi and yeah. all these other things. I'm now starting to figure out how I can monetize. And the way it is, is like, oh, duh, I'm a musician. I, I need to put out my own music. So now I'm learning about music yeah, production. Yeah, yeah. So this is what I wanted rapping. to talk to you about. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So when did you have this realization that you wanted to start doing, um, creating, I mean, you're cre you've been creating, creating content, mm -hmm. but like creating mm -hmm. your own music. When did you have that realization? I wanted to do it. I mean, back when I, when I was in Juilliard, I was like, you know what? I'm going to have an EP by the time I graduate. And then I, I totally failed at that because, like, the social media thing was starting to build. And I was yeah. so enthralled by New York. And the thing about it was I just didn't have time. I always felt like since I have time to produce content, let me just produce content. Mm -hmm. But now I can't produce content. Now there's this time vacuum that's allowing me to actually slow down and go back to the factory, go back to square one, be really bad at something again, um, and just start from the ground up. What's that so like? What What's that like to be bad at something uh, for? <laughs> man, the, all I can say is it better not take me 15 years to get good at production and rapping, okay? Because I don't think I can wait that long. Um, it's really discouraging because when, when you find that you're good at something, it's really easy to just fall back and mm. go back to what you're really good at. And, you know, Gary talks about, you know, being, I love how we're just like the guru Gary, but, uh, <laughs> no, he talks about doubling down on your, and tripling down on your strengths, Yeah. but I can't afford to pay anybody to cover my weaknesses right now. So I have to kind of invest in myself and invest in some of my weaknesses, which is music production, which is stuff I never learned about. And who right. knows, it may be a strength I never knew I had, but, you know, it's just really difficult to go back and be like man you're whack <laughs> <laughs> well did the video stuff always come really natural to you like being on camera was that was that something that was easy for you or like think back to you know mm -hmm. 2000 and what'd you say 11 like where were you with that then well video content you know, I fell into it pretty easily, but it was a rocky start. I made my first YouTube video back in the March in March of 2014, mm -hmm. um, and it was just a channel intro to my YouTube channel. It was like a minute and five seconds long, or something like that. But I, I gotta tell you, it was the hardest thing. I spent 30 minutes with the camera on, just trying to get comfortable talking to a lens. It felt mm -hmm. so awkward. My roommate was looking at looking at me weird, but oh, because you were you in a dorm doing it? I was in. Uh, I had an apartment with three other dudes. It was a two bedroom with four people. So right, because New York. Money. Yeah, because <laughs> New York. You know, my rent was six hundred twenty bucks. I wow. shared room with a dude, but like, I mean, I got that. Yeah. It was a, it was a, it was good enough for my first year in New York. But I'm telling you, like, it wasn't easy. But like, 
it was something that I always felt I wanted to do. I always wanted to, I, I'd always looked up to YouTubers. I'd always looked up to people who shared their opinions and helped people online. And I always wanted to be one of those people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew I just had to get through the aches and pains and yeah. just consistency. I think if you're trying to learn something new, even if you're bad at it, just be bad at it more. Fail right. more. Just create all the whack rhymes, all the whack beats, you know, make all the terrible videos you can and try to just do 1% better every single time. And right. Eventually, you'll be decent and you'll be like, oh, okay, I'm not, it's not so bad. You know? <laughs> right. Well, so like when you started, I, rem- I remember seeing, and I, I feel like this message is, is not coming through as much, especially now that you're creating music um, and rapping and doing beats and everything, which is great. Um, but earlier when I was following you, there was a strong message of, I'm just trying to get, I'm trying to help people understand classical music more so they can enjoy mm-hmm. it. Like that was it. Mm-hmm. Do you still feel like that's a big part of your platform now? Yeah. Yeah. And this is, it's, it's meta. It's, it's like, it's a long game. So mm-hmm. I'm trying to utilize hip hop. I'm trying to utilize uh, lyricism and rapping as a means to <laughs> really educate people on classical music. And so if you follow me here, I'm starting to see parallels between hip hop composition and classical music composition. And so I want to tell that story. I want to draw these parallels because people understand trap beats. But if I like rap about this dude who grew up in Hamburg was molested at a young age, then grew up with massive depression, burned all of his beats, all of his rhymes, all of these different things, never married, was in love with a woman who was married to another man, his best friend. I tell a story about this. And at the end, I'm saying, oh, this wasn't my, this isn't my dude, John. This was Johannes Brahms back in like 18, mm. you know, the 1800s. Like, it's human nature is the same. You know, big It's like pop. Hamilton, but classical music or something. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, but I, I've had this idea for a long time, even before Hamilton was a concept. But like taking a form that is universal, hip hop is not an African American art form exclusively anymore. Everybody around the world consumes hip hop. It originated with my culture, but it is now part of world culture. It's a part of the popular zeitgeist. So mm-hmm. it, that is a mechanism. That is a schema that I want to latch on to to then educate people about an art form that they're unfamiliar with and frankly they're intimidated by. And if I okay. can just draw parallels between Wagner, the Wagner and Brahms like beef, <laughs> you know, <laughs> their two camps rioting, you know, and relate that to Biggie, Tupac, East Coast, West Coast kind of like beef. Like if I can tell that story that'll make class music much more compelling. And then people won't think it's, oh, that's for the birds, that's for elevators, that's for rich people. That's for no, elevators. It's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's much more deep than that. Okay. So, so that sounds, it's, it's, a long it's interesting because even that, even that platform seems like it's evolved now that you're creating music because mm-hmm. before maybe when you're just starting and you're strictly classical on your viola, it was about being relatable personally, like Mm -hmm. through video content and everything. And now you're seeing these connections and drawing them and, and it's all about storytelling. I think that's so, that's such a great message because so many people just think, I think the storytelling is the missing link that in a lot of people's social media, because they go on and they're just like, this is what I do and this is who I am and this is what I like and this is me and this is what I did. And that's it, right? Which is, which is a story, but that's, that's, that's only the exposition and the resolution. The, the good parts of the story, the rising action, the conflict, the failure, the rebirth, the comeback, mm-hmm. that is stuff people are, are so deathly afraid. They're deathly afraid of posting anything that is somewhat resembling a failure. Right. And I, I try, whenever I fail, the first thing I do is I share it on social media. That's the first thing I do. I don't care if people think that I'm bad or if people think that, you know, oh, wow, why did you share that? Because most of the time, people are like, wow, that's so relatable. I just got mm. a rejection letter, too. You know, and that's what and I'm you going connect. for. Like, you connect. It's all about connection. That's the most important thing. Before we go too far, I want to say this. 
Um, even though I'm dabbling in other styles, pop, hip hop, I am at my core and will always be a classical musician. Mm -hmm. And I think you can, I know you can do both. Okay. And that's something that it, a lot of people, they think that when you leave classical music, you're gone forever. Right. And you gave up because it's too hard. And I'm like, no, when I'm running in, when I'm on the treadmill in the gym, I have Brahms string quartets going on. I have Mendelssohn. And then I have J. Cole. And then I have Kendrick Lamar. Oh, and then I have some Rippingtons. I have some jazz. Like, it's, it's not binary. Music is music is music is music. And the sooner people understand that, I think the sooner we can actually bring people into our world. Because yes. when we separate genre, you create these labels that keep people away. And that's I, not what you want to do. Yeah, and I think there's a big component um, in the classical kind of psyche that if you do anything else, whether it's learn another genre or compose another mm -hmm. genre or play another genre, almost anything else besides I'm on the audition path, it makes you not a musician or less of a musician. It's like a thing. Yeah. It's a really big thing. I felt but like that. Tell you, but you, give, me, give me a classical musician that can tote that, that's like doing all that and then come and play, come, come in a jazz club, come in, like spit in, get your jazz solo on, go to a hip hop club, Go do that. The thing is, is like I think that people who are able to code switch in different genres are more musicians than anything because they speak music. Mm -hmm. And then when you go back to classical music, the things you pick up from other genres they make you a better classical musician. They right. Make you better. Same with improvising. I mean, mm -hmm. and a lot of a lot of the the genres you're mentioning have a lot of components of the, a big component of improv in them. That's just inherently going to make you a better classical musician, I think. More confident, you know. So yeah. tell me, um, what what's a failure? Can you give me an example of a failure that you shared? Yeah, uh, just a week or two ago, I got rejected from America's Got Talent. You know, I showed in my stories, like I was auditioning for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they sent me a, a letter that, oh, we thought you were great, but... Uh, and I was like, okay, here you go. This is part of the process. <laughs> when I got rejected from CIM, um, I shared that. When I got kicked out of my teacher studio back in <laughs> junior year before senior year of, you know, uh, of undergrad. I mean, mm. sorry, of high school, I uh, got kicked out of my teacher studio. She told me a lot of things that were very hurtful at the time. And when I got into Juilliard, I shared that that uh that letter that she sent me redacted mm. of course but it's all about you know it's all about showing like look success is just actually built on failure it's not right. just success 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 you actually succeed faster when you fail more. so i right. really just try to make that a part of the diet and make it and try to normalize failure i think that's yeah. something that people are afraid to do and yeah. so I want people to feel like, oh, yeah, no, if TVK is failing, then it's okay if I fail too. The, the, what I try to just tell people is, like, you're never worse off for a try mm -hmm. because you have to work harder. You have to really build yourself up. And the worst thing that, that happens is you leave a little bit better of a player. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, so. right. So now that we're, we're talking about failure and – and also, you know, kind of feedback from people, negative, mm. positive, mm. whatever. Have you, have you gotten, um, like, has there been any, you know, we were talking earlier about how, how certain classical musicians, like there's kind of a subset of musicians who are like social media, that's not for me, that's for, you know, or entrepreneurship, that's for if you fail getting into an orchestra, kind of like mm -hmm. these misconceptions of that. So have you gotten... Um, have you gotten negative feedback or like have the shit talkers <laughs> filtered yeah. through to you? Like what's, what's happened in like thus far in your career, have you experienced, um, you know, negativity from other classical musicians who aren't going down, like say the path that you're doing? Well, people seldom come to my face with it. Mm, of course. But I, 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 a lot of stuff gets back to me about like, I'm, I'm like stuck up or I'm full of myself or this or that. Um, but that just tells me they don't consume my content, which is okay. Like it's, I'm not for everybody. And right. you know, that, that's, you know what is funny though? Most people who made fun of me or disliked me 
actually ended up changing their mind when they actually got to know me and then actually consult me. Like just somebody I recently started a professional relationship with, first thing they said to me to my face was like, oh, I introduced, I was like, hi, I'm Drew. And they're like, oh, I know who you are. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And it was exactly the subtext that you would expect. Yeah. And so they were like, you know, I want you to be real with me. Why won't you just be real? And I'm like, I don't know what you want me to do. What is that? What is that? What did they mean by that? I don't know. You didn't like, know. I want you to just, just take off your social media face. And I'm like, granted, most people when they chill with me, they don't see that. And then when they find out later, because I don't advertise that. Usually, it's people coming to me that I work with. Like, oh my God, why didn't you tell me you have had such a huge following? That's so dope. But mm-hmm. the people that end up disliking me or thinking they know me because, because of, of what I do, they end up asking me for advice. What do you think of this picture? Oh, my gosh. Can you take me on a photo shoot next time? Like, <laughs> so it's like it's 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 all love. Like, I'm not tripping. Right. OK, that's good, because I, I know that there's always going to be people who either either they talk they talk shit or they ignore it. Like it doesn't exist. You know what I mean? Oh, like I fuel it. I fuel it because when people talk, talk mess, it's like, okay, maybe there's a valid criticism you can learn from here. So I like to ask them what I, I try to confront them be like, Hey, so what can I do better? Like what is going on? That's and great. usually at the end, it's like something that I'm aware of and is like a moot point And it's just a taste. Like they just don't like what I do. And that's fine. That That's fair. Um, because you know what, Seth Godin, like I'm reading Purple Cow, mm-hmm. and he's like, if you try to create a product that is for everyone, you'll appeal to no one. Yeah. And yeah. that's so huge to me. So if you just try to appeal yeah. to a niche group, that's where you start. Because yeah. then if you really are worth something, if you're really providing value, your influence will grow. But you mm-hmm. have to start somewhere. And like, you can be the nicest person in the world and people will still hate you because you're so nice. So it's just, <laughs> exactly. you're never going to win that battle. You're never going to win that battle. Exactly. So, yeah. So never, don't try. So I stopped trying. I stopped trying. I'm a people pleaser. I love to help people. I love to have great relationships with people. But if they don't like me, I don't try to win them over. I just try to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's such a great attitude and so open minded because, you know, in the classical world, I mean, I think it's coming around. People are starting to go, hey, I see the the value in this. I see the value in actually talking to an audience and building an audience for myself. I think a lot of times people don't even realize, like, um, actually building an audience just it doesn't have to be one hundred and twenty thousand people. It can be like you know, the people that live in your city who might want to take lessons from you or something like that's, there's, there is value in being a public figure, no matter if you have 300 followers or if you have 120,000 followers, you know, you know, the old saying, like, all you need is a thousand dedicated followers to be a successful musician. Like literally like think, and, 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 and the one thing I like to tell people who don't like social media is don't do social media. If you don't like it, don't do it. You're going to harm yourself more than you're going to help yourself. And so let's let's talk about it. What is social media? Social media is just literally word of mouth. It's Mm -hmm. way more efficient word of mouth because if you put out a great piece of content, it'll exist forever. People will discover you in perpetuity. It's just the most efficient way to generate word of mouth. However... Mm -hmm. You can generate word of mouth by playing in the subways. You can generate word of mouth by, you know, bartering with a promoter to play some concerts and then going and talking with people afterward um, and build it that way. Mm -hmm. It's just less efficient. You can't appeal. You can only appeal to people who are in that area on that specific night at that specific time. Right. And everyone's always on these platforms. It's like everyone's always worldwide. 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 Exactly. I have so many people in Indonesia who like DM me and are like, oh my God, can you come to Indonesia? Same thing with Brazil. I've wow. never been either of those places. Wow. But apparently there are entire schools who are like, who like watch my content and like follow me. That's and so I incredible. I didn't know this. I didn't know this. Like, cause I sit in my living room playing my viola and practice. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> That's so cool. It's crazy, but it's efficient. That's why social media yeah. is important. However, if it's not your cup of tea, you can still do it the old-fashioned way. You can. Because guess what? Other people will talk for you on social media. 
right? Yeah. Even if you don't use it, you can leverage other people's networks. It's still possible. Yep. But, you know, I just you heard it. I just heard it to speak to that point. I just heard an interview on, on, um, on James Altucher podcast, my favorite, my favorite business podcast. Um, and it was a comedian who, um, I can't remember his name now, but, um, it was a recent episode and he, he was talking about exactly that. He, he started where he was just, it was like friends of friends telling about the next show. And before you knew it, he, he was, he was super popular and he didn't do it on social media. So it is, it is possible. It is possible. But like you said, it's the most efficient place to be is on social media. But so I totally agree with you. I have a question though. I, yeah, go ahead. Um, go ahead. About your audience. For, mm-hmm. How have mm-hmm. you, how have you noticed your audience evolve over the last, I don't know, five or six years, as far as like the interaction, the questions people have, or just the things that they say to you. Have you noticed, um, have you noticed anything change over the, over the course of time, if anything? Um, well, I will say I've only been doing this for four, actually, like four years. Four years. Okay. Yeah. So the, the 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 trend line is a lot shorter than I would like, uh-huh. uh, but I would say it started out with a lot of younger musicians. Okay, and now my the majority of my following. A lot of people think that my following is thirteen to seventeen. You know, high schoolers, okay. high schoolers. That's not even a third of my following. Um, it's probably a quarter. The like half of my following is people seventy and twenty four and twenty five to thirty four. Oh, like people my age, um, like by and large, the 25 to 34 is the largest, I think. Okay. Age. People my age. Wow. So what that's telling me, and it's gradually moving towards that way. And then it's just been exploding in that age range just because I think people crave community. And mm-hmm. what I've tried to do is when I first started, it was more about me and less about community. And what I started to do with my hashtag play homie play and, you know, honestly, I could do much more. I'm just one person. It's just, it's yeah. overwhelming and it drives me absolutely insane on the things I know I should be doing and the things I want right. to do. I can't do them all. The one thing I really want to emphasize more in 2018 is community hmm. because like I said, people are always looking for people. If yes. You can create a community of like-minded people who are supportive of each other that is so much more valuable than one person at all. And if you can establish totally agree. that, yeah. and I think that's what's happening. And that's how my trend line has kind of gone towards people more my age is because when people follow me now, I think they follow, they, they follow me for a sense of camaraderie. They see me, I'm out here grinding just like they are. Mm-hmm. Cause I follow people for the same reason, for the same way. People right. my age, I follow filmmakers, I follow other musicians my age. Cause like when I see them post, the playing video I'm like oh yeah let me go practice you know or like oh yeah let me go make a video or oh yeah let me go do this because do you it's follow very positive do you follow mm-hmm. a lot of people in other niches for um for motivation and inspiration yes. mm-hmm. most of it is uh photography and and filmmaking those okay. are my that's the other uh and I would say like uh travel travel mm. uh bloggers and things like that so I follow those people because because their feeds um, are nice their feeds are really good it's yeah. really good inspiration um, and also, yeah, their feeds are so good because they understand marketing. They understand marketing and that's not something we teach in schools. Think about it. Lindsey Sterling, Taylor Davis, some of the most popular internet violinists in the world. Okay. Some of the most famous violinists on the internet in the world were both marketing majors. Get out. They weren't violin majors. They just happened to play violin and knew how to market it. So it sounds like this is a huge, even more than like understanding how the app works, it's the marketing component. Because app, apps always change. So right. You, you always have to be adaptable on how you use it. When stories came out, you had to change. I mean, I had, I had meetings with people at Instagram slash Facebook that told me I had to double down on stories and figure out a way to create native content because that's where disproportionate concentrated attention lies and they were completely right what do you mean you had meetings like they called you up or you you called no, no, them no. Up? i i called them up because like mm. they're they're friends of 
mind and I'm always trying, I'm always a student. That's the thing. You always have to ask questions. You always have to ask what are best practices? How mm -hmm. can I break the rules? Will breaking the rules give me an, a per, uh, an advantage? For instance, highly producing stories, that's breaking the rules. Stories are supposed to be, you know, moments in time unfiltered. I know. Yeah, so, and your stories became like these <laughs> vlogs. It's amazing. Like what you, Who what you've been. Doing? No, nobody. Exactly. That, that's the thing is like, because I'm noticing all of these Instagrammers doing the things that I'm doing, I'm always trying to do things that they would rather not do, <laughs> which is like spend four hours editing an Instagram yeah. vlog. You know what I mean? Because that is what's going to set me apart. Like, always try to figure out how you can be unique and do things that people are unwilling to do. People who are unwilling to spend eight hours double tapping in a hashtag violent hashtag music. They're un they're unwilling to comment on a hundred pictures a day. So you're you know saying I mean? it's an unwillingness. Not it's not an I can't or this doesn't work for me. It's just an unwillingness. It's unwillingness because you know what? That's not sexy. But let's see, like, how are you going to win an orchestra job? Everybody's like trying to find the hacks and the shortcuts. Oh, to I be know. honest, it's just hard work. It's just putting in that unsexy, terrible metronome work, score study, listening. Yep. It's not sexy, but right. that's what's going to win you the job. Same thing with social media. It's actually being social. And that takes time. And you're going to have to sacrifice going out to the bars at night. I'm sorry. You're not going to you're going to not hang out with friends. Like people were partying and I was at home double tapping. Mm. That's just the way it is. And so, yeah, I didn't have, I haven't really had, you know, a girlfriend over the past like eight years or like a stable relationship because, you know, and then a lot of different factors, a lot of traveling, but like, I'm trying to put time into this. Mm -hmm. And you have to sacrifice some things in order to get things that you want. It's a great message. Yeah. You got to do it. Yeah. So you got to be willing to, to, to put in the work and allow yourself to actually interact with people. And I think people are really afraid of doing that. Yes. And I, I mean, I personally, I've really enjoyed watching you over the last maybe year and a half or so, how mm -hmm. you've up leveled your own game, even from where, when I first wa started watching, I'm like, dang, this guy knows what he's doing on this platform. And then, and then it's been like another level and then another level and then another level. It's like, it's impressive. So I think that's, if anyone can learn something from watching you it's that and i love that you have your following i mean it would take a while for the instagram app to load you know all the way to the first the first post yeah but there are people that still to this day say made it to the bottom they comment on my first post <laughs> they still do it like it's they so say funny. made it to the bottom i did it yes yes, yes. that's funny that's it's funny. so it's the cutest thing and 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 that's what makes me so happy about social media and just like that human interaction. Every now and then you'll have an interaction. I know, I know. You know, a lot of a lot of what I've done is on Facebook and and um, mm -hmm. that's where I started. And there is a crushing classical community, albeit small, that there's this like, you know, several handfuls of people who are like these killer people who I feel like they're my true buddies like they're the mm -hmm. entrepreneur like you said the entrepreneurial mindset people that you can go and talk to and and you know commiserate with and report wins with like hey look this happened today and we're so glad about it and everything like it's it's really it's really um like you said the community aspect is so great and and i think i think it's so important so yeah double clicking getting double out time. there and finding double the community time. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the things that I would suggest to anybody who's trying to build an Instagram following. Yes. Boil it down. Figure out what you're about. Okay. <laughs> like, what are you trying to do? Boil it down um, and try to make it one or two things and keep it, keep it that way. Okay. Um, concise. For me, concise, at least at first, and mm -hmm. then you can expand, especially when you start getting a larger following and people have varying tastes. So Something I'll post one day is for some followers and something I'll post another day is for other followers. You, know? mm -hmm. you can't always appeal to everyone all the time. Like, that's just the way it is. Um, and then what I would do is find that community, search the hashtags. And also I think that something people don't do enough of, myself included, is doing location-based 
hashtag dive in. Like if you're in Fort Lauderdale for the day, like I am, you need to go to, you know, the location of Fort Lauderdale and start engaging with people in that community. Interesting. Okay. No matter what, like, like no you're not, what. you're not going to find only musicians in Fort Lauderdale, but people in coffee shops, people in bars, people in restaurants, people here, there, yes. there. Okay. Yes. That's and you interesting. May find, you may find videographers and you're looking for a videographer. The, the thing that I found that was super interesting and fun that I did for a little while mm -hmm. was I would play a concert and then I would go to that venues, uh, not the venues Instagram, but I would go to the hashtag of the venue or I would go to the location okay. of the venue. And then I would find people who are talking about the concert they just saw and say, thanks for coming. I'm awesome. so glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for coming. You wow. Know, and I've gained followers from just doing that. Because then they're like, oh, you were like that Viola kid on stage. I'm like, what is? So That's so like, great. That's such great advice. Okay, because I think at least for this is great advice for me. Because <coughs> I, I find myself going to the same hashtags and going, okay, um, how can I broaden this? How can I reach more people that's a that's great advice the location great mm -hmm. but by and large the best and fastest way to grow is collaboration always forever it's collaboration it's 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 you know doing a pick play post split screen with somebody else with a similar size of yours or a slightly bigger size than yours because you're going to be introduced to people who don't know who you are. Okay, Even so give me an is, example yeah. of what do you mean by split, like a split screen photo, like you and that person? No, 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 no. Like you play music. Oh, okay. It, we're talking about music. So okay. Like play Pascali with somebody. Remote, remote. Right, right. Okay. Um, I can tell you some of the biggest posts that I've ever done was me playing with somebody else, like playing Mozart duos or playing Pascali with Chloe Trevor or mm -hmm. Pascali with Azima Ramsey. You know what I'm saying? Like right. people still go back to those people still go back to my collaborations, whether it's on YouTube or Instagram, and they still comment and they still like and still engage. They don't go back to the stuff I've done, but it's always stuff I've done with other people. So um one thing that I'm really focusing on as well in 2018 is, you know, collaborating more, really doubling down on collaboration. Awesome. That's the way to do it. That's, that's the way to do it. That's great. You got to. You've got to. That's awesome. You got to. You got so to. tell me, um, what what do you have coming up? Like, what do you want to promote right now? Mm, okay. Well, I am working on my very first single right now. Um, I, I, I am almost done with the the, the skeleton uh, beat for it, and now I'm writing lyrics uh, as well for it. I wanted to be storytelling. I wanted to kind of tell my story as you know, a classical musician who's an African-American who doesn't feel black enough to do hip hop, but is going to do it anyway. Mm. <laughs> you know I mean? Wow. So it's, I never fit in anywhere in classical music. I'm not white enough. I'm not Asian enough in <laughs> African-American culture. I'm not black enough. Like I don't fit anywhere. You Cause know? you play classical so. music. Is that where, where, why you're not black yeah. enough? Oh, interesting. Well, it's that and I, and I, and I, you know, I grew up in, yes, I grew up in a black neighborhood, but I went to a predominantly white school. I was in all gifted classes, AP classes, mm -hmm. uh, graduated top 1% of my class, went to, went to Juilliard, went to liberal arts college. These places don't have lots of us, uh -huh. you know what I'm saying? So it's like when they see me doing that, they think, oh, they automatically think that I don't understand the black experience, right. which is really upsetting and excluding but i want to change that you know i one of my biggest idols is childish gambino because he raps about that as well uh donald glover the actor are you familiar with him no oh man you gotta listen to some bino childish gambino <laughs> he's incredible um he was in community uh he was in the martian uh, he's an actor. He's he's uh, he was the director and writer for Atlanta, which was a series on FX. Incredible series, which is more social satire about the monolithic nature or the monolithic perception of black culture. Okay. And and it's it like flips it on its head in a very brilliant comedic way. Um, and I just I adore it. So you got to watch Atlanta and 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 listen to. Childish Gambino's uh, albums. Listen to uh, Camp. Listen to Kawaii. Listen to Because the Internet. 
Um, did you ever hear that song Redbone? No. Uh, <laughs> oh man, I was on his out his last album, um, Awaken My Love. Uh, so good. He's such he's the quintessential artist. He can do it all. He can freestyle hip hop, freestyle rap. He can sing. He can write. He can direct. He can act. Like okay, this is awesome. Is I'm gonna I'm gonna get all. I'll get these um, specific things that you think we should hear and I can link them in the show notes for people because (laughs) awesome. Well, you know what, Drew, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I want to thank you so much. I've learned so much myself and I know the, (laughs) I know the audience is going to love it. So thank you so much for being on today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Hopefully someday we could, we should do a Facebook Live or something together. That would be Please. super fun. Well, I'm looking to start a Facebook Live show in the coming months. So oh, get out. we'll be hitting you up. Yeah. Okay. Because I don't have any native Facebook content yet. So I want to double down. On it's a great place to do shared lives. And then they awesome. they stay there. So Yeah. That's yeah. what I love. It's yeah. like you can chop up the content. Mm. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great time. Everyone follow that Viola Kid on Instagram. You've got to see these pictures. You're on cruise. You're on a cruise right now. Where are you going next, by the way, before we Um, end? We're going back through the Panama Canal to hit San Diego. Oh, man. From San Diego to Vancouver, then Hawaii, then back to Vancouver, then Alaska runs. Okay, so for... I got I can't wait to see all this stuff. This is all great, all great photo ops and so awesome. So thank you so much. Thank you. Have a a great one. Bye. Bye.